Great to have you here. Um, uh, very, very proud to have that kind of uh, full room here and to do some kind of um, live stuff. So uh, let's pray to the demo gods whether that works or not. Let's pray whether the Wi-Fi works or not. We will see. Uh, but in case it does and it looks well, pretty good, we can do some nice live uh, security stuff. A few words about me. It's, um, I'm, I'm the penetration tester. I'm a developer. So I'm Christian, my name, Christian Schneider from Cologne. And I do lots of, as a freelance pen tester and consultant, lots of stuff in, in IT security, consulting with companies, helping them in terms of security architecture, hardening, and also attacking systems. But also from being a developer, I'm a little bit in the automation area, and I'm a little bit of uh, some kind of DevOps enthusiast, so I'd like to put security into DevOps as well. And this is something I'm going to do today. Uh, in a live demo, so we are experiencing some, some live hacking stuff against one of my training applications that I use throughout my trainings. And we're doing this in a way to attack it, to get some kind of security input from that, and also to uh, try to automate these things. We start with the manual approach, you helping me, so you throw things in and I ask you questions that I should do live in my environment, and we will see whether that works and we we'll get some security vulnerabilities from that. And then we're going to automate these things with open source tools. And then oh, eventually, if the time fits, we're going to put these things more into the DevOps approach. And you see how this can be fully automated. Good. So first of all, um, I'd like to give you an introduction in the training application that I use for these kinds of demos. It's a very simple one, a very simplistic one. I just created it for those hacking stuff. And it looks like that. So it's very vulnerable. It's a marathon management application. It's definitely not that I'm a marathon runner. That's not my kind of sport. Um, but I'm pretty sure a few of you uh, are in that kind of game. And um, that's definitely awesome. And this is a, a self-service application I created uh, to manage a marathon. So it's just demo data in it. And it's very simplistic in terms of UI. As you see, I'm not the UI guy. It's deliberately uh, simple, deliberately vulnerable. And I'm going to attack it along with you. And then we are going to do more and more tool stuff and more and more automation into this that then at the end can be put into a build pipeline, something like Jenkins pipelines or something like that. First of all, the, the obvious introduction to this application. So it's very simple. You do have some kind of um, three or four disciplines. <clears throat> you have a full marathon discipline here, a half distance marathon discipline, and you do also have a skater runner and a hand biker uh, discipline here. So you can just watch the, um, the standings. And you can uh, also, I'm increasing the font size a little bit for you. You can click on a runner and you see the runner profile, the public one. Uh, you can also do a search. We do have Lars Langlauf, <coughs> Lars Long Running here a little bit uh, to have some test data set into that. So I numbered my runners. And you can, for more, aside from these things, you can uh, create your own account. So that's something that you should do. And uh, when you want to log in uh, as someone else, and uh, only pre filled here from my test, you can use um, the test runner, for example. Here, you manage your profile, so it's that you are here managing your profile data. You can also upload your profile picture and uh, either importing that from a web URL like Gravata, whatsoever, or just uploading from the local file system. Uh, you can manage your attendances, whether you're attending the full discipline or half discipline marathon or whatever. And obviously, aside from managing your profile and managing the attendances, you can do everything you like to do inside uh, the public parts, obviously. And you can click log out, and then you're back out again in the non-authenticated area. And we do have an administrator who is also, uh, when I type the password correctly, kind of uh, administrator for this marathon. So you do, um, as an admin, you're not attending the marathon. You're basically maintaining the times. You're maintaining the daters uh, of the runners. And either manually or via an import. So that's the obvious XML interface. Uh, because XML is fun in terms of security. That's a very interesting, fun part. And you can manage these things. You can override every runner, and you do have a little bit of more data to be 
presented back, the blue sticky box you see here, when you just hover the mouse over the runner name, some background data gets loaded. So there's a little bit more in it, um, but that's basically the majority of the feature set. And very simple, very vulnerable, built with vulnerable technologies, vulnerable frameworks, and now we are going to attack it uh, all together. So uh, before we do things in an automated way, I'm going to introduce a few uh, security vulnerabilities in a manual fashion. So I'm asking you, what shall I do? Any idea? Okay, where and how? SQL injection was the answer. Yeah. Here's something like that. So trying to, to uh, use something like a single quote, yes. for example, yeah, and stuff like these, these characters. So uh, let's, let's do it. Uh, doesn't, doesn't work here. Um, uh, eventually, uh, we'll do some more tests. or so do it on some other kinds of um, fields. For example, in the search, when I search for Lars, we get uh, lots of Lars Langlauf uh, feature. And when I do the, the same thing that you just said using the single quote, uh, for example, I eventually marked, oh, I broke the SQL statement. So that's the first match, the obvious one. And we have a uh, few of this in it, even a blind one. And what do we get from this kind of thing? It's some kind of information disclosure. We see with vulnerable frameworks, it has been built. Struts is a very vulnerable application uh, framework. <laughs> in the past, it has been, and chose it deliberately for that. Uh, some, some Tomcat version, it's I'm pretty sure it's not the latest one. So uh, what an attacker can do from this kind of information is just by simply uh, inducing those leaked technical details, we can do some kind of uh, public research in terms of CVEs. So common vulnerability and exposure, like uh, existing vulnerabilities in existing applications or libraries or in frameworks. And we can do a version search for different kinds of online listed vulnerabilities, like I can search for Tomcat 7, oh, what, what was it? I think it's 60 something or 90 something. So here we, we see um, oh, two vulnerabilities, pretty awesome. Some code execution. Okay, this was on Windows only, but uh, some other vulnerabilities. So that's definitely not the latest patched one, nice. We can also do the same in exploit database. Uh, doing some kind of searches here, for example, to search for struts, uh, struts vulnerabilities, because it's a very vulnerable framework, and you see lots of remote code executions, three pages, so 32 and counting. And um, that would be very interesting to, to have some first uh, way to get into this. So now, um, but aside from, from doing these kinds of research steps, I like to go more on the application layer with you. So we got the SQL injection. This leaked us some kind of stack trace stuff. But what can an attacker do? It can uh, try to break further into the database and do more harmful stuff in it. Um, but what actually you were doing was just using one um, idea of a vulnerability and putting that kind of pattern, so I used the single quote, into this form field. That's the obvious one here. Um, but that's basically, I'd like to do a little bit more with you. So any other ideas? Admin, admin for the password. Yeah, it's uh, obvious. Okay, let's see if that works. Never say never. And, uh, oh, oh, no, <laughs> it's not working. But it's close to that. <laughs> um, any other idea? Yes. Maybe some Yeah. On the results table, so for example, here we see marathon equals zero in the URL. That's the full distance. I can go back and do the same with uh, half distance. That's the one, and uh, the, the skater marathon is a two. So I could try eventually here something like one marathon equals one is half distance. Marathon equals two is the skater. And eventually I could do something like well, two um, minus one, let's see if that works out. So, oh, I see the half distance. So something's evaluating. So I, I put some kind of, you don't use the plus because it's the URL encoded space character, uh, but minus, that's something that works pretty well. And that's smelly a bit. It's not a vulnerability yet that's proven, but it's some kind of 
well, interesting hotspot. And um, if it's a SQL injection, I could do something like, well, let's assume it's in the where clause. It's somewhere in the where clause. We're reading data, select something from something, where something. So it would be a wise, wise idea simply to um, put a space and one equals two, or one equals one. That's interesting. So and true does actually not change anything. That's the most simple, the most polite way of testing, and obviously don't do these things where you do not have permission to pen test. That's the obvious disclaimer. Don't want to get you into trouble. But here I do have on my system, and it's uh, two and one equals one. So I, I would expect that it's giving us some, well, it's not a, a um, valid ID or something like that, but I do get the same result. And now I could do the counter proof, and one equals two, if I do this, I get zero rows. So it's somehow collapsed to zero. That pretty much means that we were able to uh, prove it from the outside. Somehow that's a SQL injection, something like that. Again, so fourth, do, four do we have? That's the second one. And I don't know whether you notice it directly. I did not uh, need any stack trace. So I don't need the obvious proof. We can do it also via some kind of comparison of the response. So taking the response of the first result and the second, and then we can compare these two and giving the fact that we get the same data and no data, we prove it using the Boolean blind test. We even have more tests like time-based ones. So to assess the response time of how quick it returns something or, or whether we were able to introduce a delay or we can do it even via some back channels so that we can get something via a DNS resolution. So I think you get the picture of um, there are for different vulnerabilities, different heuristics and different detection capabilities that we can use. That pretty much sounds like something we can automate. Anything else we'd like to test? Cross-site scripting. Cross scripting. That's the second uh, vulnerability type here. Yeah, okay. So. Um, I could test the obvious uh, form field for that. <laughs> Why not? So how many of you have uh, already had some kind of contact with cross-site scripting things in terms of fixing or finding or searching? That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, so it's by far the most, the most frequent vulnerability to be observed in the web security thing. And we are going to test this here as well. So let me just introduce... Some, some characters, so I'm, I'm searching for something that's not existing, so I get two reflections back, Z, 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 that's pretty nice, and well, I could do, um, try to put some kind of um, simple markup into this, and then we see it's um, returning here as I just put it into the field, but here it's evaluating. So here that seems to, seems to be vulnerable. And if it's vulnerable to some kind of cross-site scripting, then I can introduce HTML that at the end executes some kind of uh, JavaScript just to prove that it's a thing. Usually we use these alert boxes uh, just as a proof. Uh, the obvious uh, attacker scripts are totally um, innocuous and uh, not to be seen by the victim, of course. But here we see a lot one, that's a finding. So we do have a reflected cross-site scripting. And we do have, in this little application, over 30 in different, different areas and different difficulties. So if you're going to be more on the pen testing things, that's something on the workshop on Friday that you can find out. But for now, that's, that's a nice one. So we've got a, a simple reflected one. So let's go for more. Um, for example, I can try to use the show live results feature, slow or quick. So I just clicked on slow. We do see a refresh parameter here in the URL. Refresh equals 20,000 something. So every 20 seconds, 20,000 milliseconds, the page reloads itself. And well, I could do and inspect the source code. And then I see it's some JavaScript. So we do have some JavaScript code that is executing the, um, the reload, just a one-liner, very simple. And now the idea would be to, um, to put some kind of payload into it. Any idea? So to prove alert one. So I'm already inside JavaScript, so I can simply close the parentheses would be a nice idea. 
and then just a semicolon alert one. And then I can just uh, keep the, the dangling one open and should yield me again a reflected cross-site scripting. A second one in a JavaScript context, nice. But now, um, what about persistent ones? So we've had two SQL injections, the one in the runner search, the second one in the uh, UL parameter of the marathon ID. We do have had already two reflected cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, one in the, um, in the search field, the obvious one, another one in the uh, refresh parameter. Um, well, what about persistent cross-site scripting vulnerabilities? So those that are actually triggering when you persist your, your data as a payload in the system. Any idea? Yep. Uh, Something like that. So uh, as a locked in user to put the payload in the username and, and fields like that. So yeah, that would be a nice idea. So I can just create a user called pentest um, with the obvious password. <laughs> and then I could put some kind of um, Let's see, payload into it before we automate these things. Usually I would do it in all the form fields, and this is what the automation will later do. I'm now, for the sake of the demo, just using the first name. And create the account. Uh, doesn't trigger here. I can read it in full beauty. It's um, not triggering. I don't even see it when I Take a look at the source code. Uh, it's correctly encoded. That looks, that looks fine. I can confirm my data and log in as this little friend. And uh, again, here it's not triggering. So, well, doesn't yield anything. Click log out. I can do the search, for example. I can search for this run as another user. Could be a, an admin or a logged in another user or just public user right now. And here I see runner pen test and didn't trigger. I can see it in full beauty here. But let's take a look. Ah, here's a tooltip. Show profile of script alert one, first name, last name. Well, let's take a look. And if I take a look at the response, I see it's, uh, oh, that's the, the directly uh, the presenting of the last name that looks pretty correctly encoded. But the tooltip here, that looks a little bit, uh, as if the encoding is missing, so that looks vulnerable. But it's not yet triggering, it's inside the title attribute, so I need to break out of this attribute a bit. So I need to close the double quote and the angle brackets in order to adjust my payload to work. So I put this little, uh, oh sorry, uh, this little friend in front of it, click the save button, and when I now search for that little user, uh, let's see, I see, ah, oh, it works. So here we do get some kind of uh, alert again, a persistent or stored cross-site scripting. We do have another type as well. The third type will be DOM-based. That's nice, easier to exploit. Well, I could, um, well, let's go for another one. So when I just click on it, I see here runner um, first name, last name, runner first name, last name. That looks pretty correctly encoded. And even here in the title, I see it looks pretty, pretty correctly encoded. But well, let's take a look. Here I see in the direct response, runner first name, last name, encoding is correct. But when I go up, I see in the title, ah, that is not correctly encoded. So it somehow appears to be vulnerable. Um, but it didn't trigger. Why didn't it trigger? Any idea? inside the title tag. Browsers just don't execute things in titles. So I just, well, um, close the title. It's as easy as that. Triggers here. <laughs> Runs profile, public profile link here. Triggers there. So you, you get the picture. It's, an, it's a matter of putting payloads in different spots of the application and getting an idea where data gets put back in the response. So eventually you need to adjust your payload a little bit. It's a little bit of trial and error. It's a way of permutating payloads with input vectors. Input vectors are the form fields, the URL parameters, headers, tokens, cookies, whatever you can send as the malicious attacker to the web server. And then you can see what you can get from that. 
whether you uh, get something that's executing, taking a delay, or just comparing those two results and getting some info from that. Well, what about another vulnerability before we go more into the tools stuff? So we need to find the findings first. Uh, any idea? What about this one here? So when I just click on a runner, uh, I get this profile picture. So here, here we do have copy image location. We get from this image location some kind of uh, URL. So it has been uploaded, well, that's the default one, has been stored on a file system somewhere, and, well, eventually we can get something else from the server because when it's being delivered, we see here photo equals, and then it's just a file name. So, huh, any upload a script and execute, that would be a nice idea, yeah, but if, in terms of uh, reading something from the server, what about um, e e any file? Slash etc, the classic, if it's a Linux server, etc password, give it a try, it doesn't work, damn. So it's not eventually that we are in the correct folder. What do I need to do? Yeah. I go up, yeah. Go up, go up, go up, adjust it a little bit. Let's zoom in. So we can then use the dot dots slash trick. One folder up, doesn't work. Two folders up, didn't do the trick either. Three folders up. Well, also not working. What when you're on the Linux system in the root folder and you go beyond the root? Does it explode now? Nothing. So better more than. And et voila. So basically, we're seeding a photo that was being uploaded in a certain configured fixed folder where all the marathon images or folders or pictures are residing. And we are just referencing it from there by the, the variable file name in a fixed folder. And by just using the correct meter characters, dot, dot, slash, uh, multiple times, we can change that from the, um, from the expected folder we are breaking out, we're traversing the path into another folder. Nice. Yeah, so we, we did some kind of nice test. So uh, it's full with more vulnerabilities, more to come, but now I think it's a nice idea to get more into the automation stuff. So um, how can we do this? Um, basically, we do have different tool categories in this arena. We do have DAST tools, SAST tools, and IAST tools. DAST, SAST, and IAST. DAST, DAST, stands for Dynamic Application Security Testing, and that's particularly the, the fun part. Like we did manually, now oh, you and, and me, we were doing it together manually here in the application, uh, permutating payloads with different input vectors and seeing, well, how it goes, uh, any, any clue that it works. And this can be automated by just permutating attacker payloads sent and created by a tool onto those different input vectors. And we do have tools in this arena, open source and commercial ones, and I'm going to, uh, I'm using both. Both categories, also the commercial ones are good, but I'm advocating the open source ones because they're also good. And I'm going to introduce an open source tool called OWASP ZAP. That's something eventually you know. OWASP ZAP, yeah, 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 yeah. hands go a little bit up. It's a nice tool. I'm going to zoom in where we're doing things. It's a nice tool in terms of uh, being something like the pen tester IDE. And uh, for a free open source thing, that's, that's pretty nice. So it actually creates a uh, proxy server. It's an HTTP, HTTPS proxy server that it is creating locally. And we can then tunnel or proxy any HTTP or HTTPS traffic through that. So it's even capable of proxying and breaking up HTTPS traffic because it's our traffic. It's not a tool to uh, sniff and get uh, some, some traffic of other people. That's not the kind of thing. We have different tools for that. That's something that you can use to be stronger in hitting the server. So your traffic is opened, and basically when it's HTTPS encrypted against your pen testing target, then you can obviously uh, import the self-signed certificate ZAP is going to generate as trusted, and then you can even open your own HTTPS traffic. Good. So all these tools 
they are working roughly in the same area. So you, you do have, it's like a browser console on steroids. You do have a history tab, lots of requests. All the requests I executed are already in there. You've got a sitemap. And how is the sitemap filled? How is the history filled? You can click on any requests and see the details. You're not going to zoom in, it's just HTML. It's basically uh, that this tool pro opens the proxy port and I configured this already to be on port 7777 on my local machine here. And I just used the uh, Firefox as my web client to configure in the preferences the proxy server to be uh, this localhost 7777 thing. And when you're surfing on localhost, don't forget to exclude it from the no proxy for list. So you can, you can use any web client. Could be a web browser, could be a, a fat client, a rich client, as long as it's accessing some kind of HTTPS backend or HTTP backend SOAP services or, or REST services. Could even be an app, so you can use your tablet or smartphone and in the same Wi-Fi expose the ZAP proxy port and configure that kind of port on the same Wi-Fi to be the internet proxy. You have to play a little bit with the certificates that they trust each other and depending on how the apps are using certificate pinning, you might get the background traffic while you're using an app. Here if we're using basically just the, the browser as a driver right now and later we go more to the automation stuff. So. We have this already set up here, I did this already, and we do have some uh, traffic observed here inside this tool. For example, I can go back to the home screen and search for Lars. Bam, now I see inside Zap that we do have a form post. It's just a form post on the search runner page, and it's giving me here the, the headers and the search term, the form fields that I submitted, and the response that we got back. Nice. So what about uh, attacking this? Why not? So I can simply try to give this some kind of test, but before doing it, I would like to give you the two major types that these tools are able to scan. So they all do passive analysis by default, and passive analysis is by definition non-invasive. That means they're just scanning the, uh, the source code they are seeing and the requests they are seeing, so what's being sent to the server, what's being returned from the server, and they are deducing certain security issues from that. I wouldn't say vulnerabilities because it's uh, the, the whole, well, the high-hanging fruit you just don't find by watching the traffic, <laughs> you need to test. But in terms of seeing something like bad cookie headers, bad, bad flagged uh, cookies, bad headers, missing security, hardening things, missing tokens and stuff like that. That's something that these tools, even in a passive analysis, can give you. And later we speak about how to fully put this tool into a build pipeline. Mm. First of all, we see uh, on the alerts tab a little bit of passive findings. So, ah, it caught an application error disclosure. That's pretty nice. So it's just a, like a second pair of eyeballs, just taking a look and, ah, we do have this stack trace stuff here. That's something you should uh, go after. Uh, some hardening headers are not set and some cookies are not hardened and that's the low hanging fruits, but it's, hey, it's passive analysis. For more, you need to do the active stuff. And we do already now have lots of requests in it. These tools, I'm going to show this later, can be configured very intensively, but what I'm going to do is I just use the default config before we go into more configuration stuff. So everywhere where you can click on a um, request, I do it right click here, um, just the form post I sent, and I can then uh, use the active scan, attack active scan thing. And then I do have default settings, fine for now. And I just, we do have permission, otherwise it would be illegal. And when I just, well now, hit start scan, this kind of page, this kind of request, it's pretty quick here on my machine, is being scanned and it, it yields up to, well let's say seven, eight hundred something tries. You see lots of errors appearing on the right side. And now it's through 932 requests, just this little one request. And I can click on any attempt uh, but that's not something I'm going to do here. I tried some SQL injection, for example. Um, it's more interesting to see the findings. So if I go on the alerts tab, we see, ah, oh, nice. Findings, first findings, red flag are coming up. So we do have the SQL injection 
proven. So I've got an explanation here, and here the, uh, the, the uh, request and response, with the payload and the result. And I do also have the cross-site scripting here. So it tried something like um, script alert one in the search term, classic one, and then we get here in the response uh, also marked already that that's a finding. Nice. So that way we can do manual stuff and go more manually into these kinds of things. But it would be nice to be more on the automated way. So uh, we, do have uh, we do have capabilities for this as well. So um, all these tools, including the commercial ones, they do have some kind of... Um, Get lucky mode. <laughs> so it's just a quick start thing, whatever. Um, and it's it's a it's a well, uh, it's not working basically. So it works, but uh, it could be better. In terms of uh, what do you want to be, compliant or secure? Uh, if it's just to do the checkbox uh, thing of uh, like we yes we did scan something, then that's something for you. If you want to get more into the thing and get more findings and more interesting results, I would recommend to. Um, do something more than just giving the URL, and it will automatically crawl. Because all these crawlers, they do have uh, at least one of three crawler problems, if not even the combination of that. So a typical crawler problem would be, hey, JavaScript. If it's a too dynamic application in terms of JavaScript, it could be that many crawlers are not working in the way that you would expect them to work. Some do evaluate JavaScript, some don't. Some do a little bit. And, uh, well, it's like, in the extreme, a single-page HTML application, an SPA, and it just crawls and through. And what did you crawl? The index HTML and the background requests. What background requests? So JavaScript could be an issue there. Second kind of uh, uh, crawler problems you might uh, come up with all these get lucky modes is something like business order. So the order of requests, typical scenario online shop. First, put the products in the shopping cart and then proceed to checkout. Wouldn't make any sense to proceed to the checkout with an empty shopping cart. You're immediately thrown back to the start page or to the product page. Please put something in your cart before you can purchase stuff. But how does the tool know? If it's just crawling and spidering, could be by coincidence that it's just starting with the checkout process, immediately thrown back, and then doing product view and put product into shopping cart, and well, I'm through. The whole checkout process was missed. And last but not least, the third possible problem would be business, valid business data you need to put into the fields. Like for an online shop, IBAN Swift codes or valid addresses that survive an address check or even for expert systems, some more kind of um, business data you need to put into that. So chances are really quite high that you miss lots of your application by just providing the start URL, a little bit of authentication data, and that's it. So that's not something I would recommend, aside from being just well compliant. But we do have a solution for this. And the solution would be to use a different mode of operation that all these tools have. And one different mode of operation is, it, it's always called differently in the tools, but I call it scan as you surf. So it's just basically that you just surf through the application and step by step you're the Zap tool is following you. So you take it along through the application with, for now, a real client. We will later do this or discuss about how this can be done in a more automated fashion. For now, next step would be to use a real client like a browser, evaluating JavaScript correctly, doing the tests in the correct order because human is surfing, and doing it with the correct business data. And just putting this tool in the scan as your surf mode. And that essentially means it's following you step by step. You're taking it at the end and it's basically following you step by step and actively attacking every newly seen request in the application. So you're providing the path through it and it's following you and attacking. That's pretty simple and pretty nice. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this right now to give you an impression of how this works. And what I do is I just go to, ah, that's just from the, the scan of this form field, nice. <laughs> and I'm just, uh, session, yeah, same session. And I'm just doing this um, by quitting the tool and starting out fresh. Just for the sake of the demo, just need to find the correct tab. Uh, that's the one. 
And now we go up again. Empty zap. And dum -dum 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 -dum. Yep. So what I'm doing now is um, I'm not yet configuring it to some great extent. This is I'm going, something I'm going to show at the end. What I'm doing is I do the obvious mandatory configuration setting, the one and only one you need to do. And that's the, in Germany we say Kindersicherung, <laughs> that's the um, child protection. So you need to have some kind of safety protection that you're not coincidentally or unwillingly attacking something else. Be just assume you forgot to, um, to remove the proxy and go next step, Facebook.com, whatever. It's following you step by step. That's not something you would like to do with your IP address. So in terms of the scan as your surf mode, uh, like active live scanning or attack mode, it's named differently here. I just call it scan as your surf. Um, it is for this Zap tool that it's only attacking when you set it to have some kind of context defined. That means we do have a default context here already predefined and empty, and you can, you can have multiple ones. You can be very flexible with that. I just double click on it. And here I have the, the capability to include stuff and exclude stuff. So I can, I can be very specific what to exclude, multiple regular expressions. So uh, that's something very uh, flexible. And um, I'm just providing it the one include that's sufficient uh, that is basically pointing to my URL here. So I just, it's for the sake of this demo, localhost, copy. And I'm just um, adding this in the context field. And most importantly, that's the typical failure scenario, I need to provide a dot and a star at the end because it's a regular expression. Otherwise, it would not do too many things because it's just taking this one page and <laughs> nothing below that. This basically means any character multiple times. So anything below that, that's in scope. Click the Add button, click OK, and zoom out. So now I define the context. I'm sitting ready to go on the start page. And last but not least, I need to unlock the weapon. That is putting this tool into the scan as a surf mode, as I call it, or attack mode, as Zap is calling it. And when I'm just doing it, it asks me, well, yes, do you really? Yes, uh, really, that's okay. And now, if I've done it correctly, it's uh, ready to go. And we just need to surf manually right now, later in a more automated way, through the application. Let's see. I just click on, well, let's say full distance. Click. And now I should see something. Yeah, it's, it's working. That's pretty nice. It's scanning. Progress bar is not increasing because it doesn't know when it's finished. It's just waiting for me step by step. It's queuing. I do get results already in the, in the finer tabs in the alerts tab, and it's queuing the request. So every request that I take after this, as soon as, or as long as it's in scope, is actively attacked. I can be quick, it's just following me and working on the queue, depending on the configuration of parallel activity. And um, I can log in, I will do this in a few minutes, and, but don't click on log out. <laughs> because it will scan uh, even further when you are still logged in. So otherwise, you would terminate uh, your session. That wouldn't make any sense. So I can click on the slow link. I can click on a runner. I can execute the search, search for Lars. I can log in as, let's use the uh, user Jane. And when I'm logged in, I can, well, uh, save the... Uh, the profile, so now it has an error. That's something that can, depending, because it's working in the background, that is somehow changing my data. That's something that you should be aware of in terms of automating these things. And uh, because it's, it's disturbing the way you work with the application, you see. And uh, let's do it again, save. And now your data has been saved. So there's something working in the background and doing something nice. So now, while this is working, we do have more scans. It's scanning actively. Oh, it's true. That's quick. 8,000-something requests. Awesome. And, um, okay, local host, huh? And no network latency. 
And we do have some findings, sequence injections, path traversal, cross-site scripting, nice. So we do have a cross-site scripting, for example, the one in the, uh, the URL, uh, the, in the refresh parameter, we do have the alert one thing here. So uh, that's the request and that's the response. Nice, so it's even marking the spot as a proof. Same is true for the post. Post request in marathon search runner, search term, that's the obvious finding and it resulted, result of searching for script alert one. We do have the um, one in the form post where we updated our profile. So first name uh, was changed by Zap to this kind of thing and the response just gives us runner closing title so it's even context aware in terms of the document object model where it needs to break out and then it's basically um, uh, script alert one and opening the title first name and last name. So two findings. Different SQL injections. So what do we have here? I've got a plug-in to do more scans. And we do have um, something like one equals one and one equals two. Uh, the um, Boolean blind test. So it's using random numbers and just comparing the results. And we do have a path traversal. So we do have here something like a request photo dot dot slash, so it uses many <laughs> paths, uh, percent to f is just the slash in the proper encoded way, etc slash passwd, and it got back a etc passwd nice one. That's pretty nice and working quite well. So that's the way we can automate these things. We just need to have something that's driving, something that's driving traffic, sitting in the driver's seat and creating valid traffic. Could be you, <laughs> personally. Uh, definitely something that's, that's fun because, we, well, you know, interesting findings are coming. But we are speaking about DevOps. So we're speaking about more pace, more automation of our tools. And now we've got this scan engine here and we just need to drive the traffic. And for this we do have different options. First of all, we can use existing UI test automation. The more agile we are, the more UI or service test automation we do have, otherwise we couldn't securely go live <laughs> in terms of feature correctness and stuff like that. So we can reuse the existing traffic emitting things that we use in our test harnesses to drive valid integration test drive traffic. This could be a user interface test so we can use Selenium or whatever you're doing. Uh, you can even record with this tool uh, some Zest scripts that are being replayed and it is cookie and token aware. Uh, we can also reuse, when you're creating a SOAP or REST web service, we can reuse the test clients that we are generating or we are using to test the correctness and just proxy the traffic through that. Let's see if I got a slide less talk, but well, disclaimer. <laughs> and I do have at least a few slides. So um, what, about, um, what, about, what about the slide I'm going to pull? Uh, something like that. So we can then end up in something like having some kind of um, uh, automation in terms of uh, CI jobs, uh, could be a Jenkins or whatever, and it's using build scripts just to Maven, Gradle, whatever you do, uh, to build whatever you're building. If it's a user interface thing, just use the UI tests, record them and reuse them, or just use the existing ones. And the rep driver is then proxying the traffic through Zap, which has been started automated in your build automatically. Going to do this right in a few seconds. And against the test system locally, uh, you can lose data, so don't do it <laughs> in production. And then get the report findings and decide whether you want to break the build, make it instable, or just do whatever you want with that. Same is true for the service test. So that's a way we can put the security in DevOps, so DevSecOps style thing. And if only we could use the ZAP without the UI, and we can. It has a headless mode. We even do have an official Docker image, so it can be used just well, on the command line minus daemon and it's spun up headless. So it's pretty easy to just pre-configure it and just start it headless in your build. Docker, or I, don't, I don't care if it's Docker or not, it's just a command line, and then proxy traffic through it. But how can we interact with that kind of thing if it's not having a UI? It's having an API. So it's having a very good REST API that's by default also being reachable on the port number uh, that you're just exposing the proxy port. So it's a little bit weird. You have the port number that's 
a valid HTTP, HTTPS proxy, and when you directly access it with the browser, you get the API. Usually, you should use a random API key. Uh, in every request, I just disabled that for the sake of the demo. And when you open the API of this little friend, you get different kinds of, um, I'll increase the font size a little bit, you get different kinds of uh, categories like a scan for the active scan or context. Well, the kinders are showing the child protection, so just define the context in terms of regular expressions. Core for major stuff. Um, P scan for passive scan, stats, user, whatever you want to do. And it's almost that anything you can do in the UI, you can just do using the API. So I could give you a demo in a headless way, but then you wouldn't see anything. <laughs> so what I do is I just quit Zap, just close it, I restart it, and, oops, English keyboard layout, minus help, and then you see the command line interface uh, things. You see stuff like, yeah, you see it's like the daemon uh, uh, flag you do have here, or you do have uh, some other kinds of pre-configuration stuff you can give it, and uh, well, whatever you want. But I'm just uh, starting it head full, <laughs> that you see how it would work headless. Because I'm now, I, I promise, I'm not touching the UI. Uh, I'm using the REST API to just set it into the pre-configured state that we want it to be. So it's empty, uh, so it's in standard mode, not in the attack mode, scan as a surface, not yet been activated. I just double click on the, uh, on the context thing. Uh, come on, yeah, here it works. And then I show you that including context is empty, nothing in it. So the first, I need to do two things at least. Define the context, the regular expression, and set it into attack mode. Okay, that's something I can do. So I use the context thing first, should be in the context area of the API. We do have views and actions. We can read something and we can write or execute something. I would like to execute including context. Usually I would be rest full correct and use the post, but I can use the get as well. It works even though it shouldn't be state changing with the get. It's just for you to be easier to automate in a curl script. Just a curl script in your build pipeline, bam, that has been executed. So I use the default context and I give it the regular expression. I still have it in my clipboard. Hopefully, yeah, I do. Oh, don't, don't, don't clip it twice. Okay, so one time. Here, HTTPS, it would be in reality wherever you deploy it, marathon dot star. Include in context, okay. So the context should have been defined. Using the UI, you can debug your call scripts where there's something not working. Let's cross check and, oh yeah, has been set. That's fine, nice. So last thing would be to unlock the weapon and make it from standard mode into attack mode. And that's something we can also very easily do. And um, using the API, and I'm just uh, going back, that's, that's something that's definitely sitting in the core area. So I use the, uh, let's open this in a new tab, I use the core API stuff. And we do have something like set mode. Let's see where it is. Here it is set mode. And ah, these are the, the uh, predefined ones and I just use the attack one. Uh, okay, set mode, result okay. So now cross-check in the UI, I see, yeah, that's because it's not headless, it asks me, but it's not asking you whether you do have permission, stuff like that when you're headless, and you see it's in the attack mode. Nice. So now I just need to execute again the traffic generating stuff. So let's uh, make it a little bit less big. Okay and go to the home, execute the search, still having for my old session, <laughs> execute the search, click on a runner, click on the discipline, let's say full distance, and click on slow, and update my profile, or upload a file, or whatever I want to do. Just don't click on log out, and just be a little bit error um, aware, might, might give you some errors. So now I see it's running, and while it's running, 
Uh, I can see this in the API as well. I need to be quick because it's so quick locally. I can do a scan, active scan, and I can just, just check the attack mode Q, and it gives me zero. <laughs> so I wasn't that quick. Uh, it's just the number of requests that are queued on the table that Zap is not currently working on. I, do have, uh, I think I do have a parallelity configured of uh, three concurrent attacking requests, so that it's working on three, and the fourth, fifth, sixth would be on the table, would be one, two, three in the queue. And if it's zero, basically there's nothing in the queue, and it's already working on all of those. And if it's minus one, I just reload it now, it's that even the, the actively attacked things are empty at this kind of list. So that's a good indicator if it's not that you're having more Selenium requests or REST service requests that Zap is through. And Zeb also understands, like all those tools in this arena, um, JSON requests and uh, XML requests. So when you do have a REST API or do have a, um, a SOAP web service, it's putting its payload tests and all the XML tags and attributes and all in the JSON attributes to be properly uh, still XML and JSON, not destroying it, but it might trigger in the backend. So I just um, use it in the headless way, showing you just with the UI that it works. And finally, I need to just get the, the data out of it. And for this, we also do have some API. So now I'm through with the build, or with, the, with the checks, and I, I, first thing we need to do is check whether we need, need to break the build, make it instable or broken, depending on the severity and numbers of the findings. And for that, we do have something, I think it's in core, it is, alerts summary either for a subtree of the URL, I just use the empty one, so give me all the alerts, and I get oh, 15 high findings, 17 low, 23 medium, and zero informational. Nice, so that would be definitely a red build, <laughs> and, um, because so many high critical findings. Now I need to get the details. That's also something we can do, and I can, I can get it finding by finding, I can get it in a very detailed way, but I like to get a report. So I can do something like an HTML report or a JSON report or MD5 or XML if I want to process it further. Let's access the JSON uh, report. So we get JSON that's giving us the findings. So it's the alerts are properly in this kind of thing here and we can just by number whatever the low, low findings and sequence injection are a nice one. But we can also use this to get the HTML report. So if I just go back and do it that way, then uh, HTML report, we get it in a nice configured, uh, nice uh, HTML export. So it's a little bit something you can put in the build to just to inspect it for the reason why something broke. Questions about this? Uh, one last step, let's see, pray to the demogods, working so good so far, is that I open, um, yeah, let's do it here. I open this little friend. We do have plugins for ah, it's right. We do have plugins for this as well. So uh, some static analysis, some dynamic analysis, some dependency analysis. What I did was in uh, uh, more on this on the training on Friday. Uh, in the configuration here, it would be a Jenkins file. I uh, just do it in the text here to edit. So I have different phases. So I've got a preparation phase where I just pull my marathon stuff and I'm just building it using Maven. Then I'm doing some code analysis using find security box. I'm just spinning up the, uh, he's spinning up the uh, integration tests locally. That's just a shell script part of my code base uh, in, in the uh, repo. That's starting the database with a predefined test set. It's starting local, the Tomcat with the deployed build WAR file in it. And then I'm doing dynamic scan execution. And here I'm basically just executing, you see, lots of curl scripts. Lots of curl scripts on the A-scan API. I set some policies, configure it more than we just showed in this thing. Define the context, uh, including context, set mode, and then I set mode to active. So I'm going to scroll a little bit uh, to the right. You, should, you would see that. And then I'm just checking every 30 seconds whether the build is uh, through or the, the tests are through in terms of me polling the attack mode queue. And if it's minus one, it's through because it runs asynchronously. I need to poll, obviously, and at max 20 times. And then I'm just uh, shutting things down and just collecting the results. Let's give it a try 
uh, if I just execute this in the last three minutes, build now. And this is the first time that it's nice when it's red. <laughs> so let's click on the tail and we see it's compiling. And I just have a recorded set of UI test requests that I use. Uh, I recorded them with Zap and Zap has a Zest uh, type of, uh, it's called Zest. Uh, recording of uh, requests and it's replaying them, token aware and cookie aware, obviously, so it's logging in, getting a fresh token, maintaining that. You could use Selenium as well, whatever you like. And it's building, might take a few minutes, and then it's uh, later giving us a report. Okay, so while this is building and building and downloading, I can click on the graph here and you see uh, that you do have uh, some time. Oh yeah, so it's now doing the dynamic scan execution. That's good. So I'm now in the waiting for Zap to initialize phase here. You see it's starting Zap locally, headless, really headless. And uh, then it's executing the curl scripts. And it waits for a few seconds to initialize because uh, uh, might take some time. You see those curl scripts, including the responses. Result, okay, that's pretty good. So you can debug your scripts, setting the mode, setting the attack policy and stuff like that. Now it's sleeping for 30 seconds because, well, I just was too lazy and just poll every 30 seconds. Very simple. And it has already done some static analysis as well. And after that, it sees, ah, oh, we are through minus one, and then it's um, the attack mode queue. It's give, fetching the results, and I'm using a nice plugin inside um, uh, uh, Jenkins that is uh, giving me some, some detailed reports, and I can configure the thresholds of whether a build should be instable or broken. And now it's build failure. It's nice for me to see a build broken that way, because we do have number of, zap, uh, number of detected zap alerts is too high, compared to the threshold, so failing. And we do get some kind of uh, details here. You see from the alerts summary, I got 12 high and something like that. And now, right now, on the marathon, I do have a failed build. Failed build due to zap scan finding too many alerts. I can go into the report, and here I see the high risk findings, the medium risks, and the low risks. That's pretty nice. You can open that, click on this. You can drill down in that. It's basically saved in your build. Okay, and to the minute I'm through with the way you can put using open source uh, tools security scans and checks into your build pipeline. Hopefully you enjoyed these uh, fully packed uh, minutes. I definitely. Uh, I'm giving a training on these and more things on Friday here. And also, if you want to ask questions, I'm a little bit here now, uh, right now just shutting things down. And here is my business card. So if you want to just drop me a line, you can ask me questions anyway afterwards. Thank you very much.